the, the biggest value I see when I think about the question that way really is in the development of the electric transmission space. Because I tend to think, and I've said it many times before, that there's really no transition without transmission. Like we saw that on the gas side and the big build out of um, you know, thousands of miles of pipelines years ago. And you know, we, we, need, we must have that in order to be successful with many of our goals um, on the electric side. Welcome to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Cam, a podcast for industry professionals who are transforming the industry using digital. I'm Jeffrey, and in this show, we look at various digital innovations that help lower costs, improve productivity, and reduce emissions. If you want to discuss this show further or just stay in touch, you can contact me on Twitter at Jeffrey Can or at JeffreyCan.com. In this episode, I'm in conversation with Chip Moldenhauer, who is the founder and CEO of Arbo, a regulatory data analytics company. Regulatory data, which is mostly unstructured text and tables, is highly fragmented and dynamic, which slows down our permitting processes at precisely when we need permitting to speed up so that we can proceed with new energy investments. There's real money at stake here because long drawn out permitting makes the economics of energy investments untenable. As Chip says, there's no transition without transmission. Here's Chip. Chip, welcome to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. Glad to be here, Jeff. Uh, thanks. Uh, great time of year here in uh, Washington, D.C. Cherry blossoms are out <laughs> blooming and energy industry is booming, uh, especially today. So ex excited for the chat. Yeah, it's very good. There's lots going on in the energy world. Um, but uh, cherry blossoms actually in Japan are blooming earlier than ever they ever have because the uh, planet is warming up. And the, apparently the, it's not light that triggers the blossoms, it's the heat level. Uh, I don't know if that's happening. Is that same thing happening in Washington? Yeah, it's a progressive. I was reading an article recently. It's been progressively moving up as far as the blossom date. And I think this year we we're about two weeks earlier. So yeah. uh, we had a particularly mild winter and, and we're seeing it uh, with respect to the blossoms. Wow. Well, my only hope is that we don't have year round bears. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. When they get out of hibernation, they wreak havoc on the unsuspecting. Uh, and it, so we have a bird feeder in the back. It's got some suet in it. And the worry is the bears will tear the thing apart before we take it down for the season. So, so <laughs> energy, uh, our energy world is uh, causing uh, some, you know, all of us to have to react a little bit. But, you know, this, let's get into the conversation, though, with you and, and your business in particular, but and start a little bit about your background, where, where and how you, you know, get into what you're doing. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, my professional background after graduating from the Naval Academy was uh, serving in the Navy, and you know, there's lots of different ways to serve in the Navy. Mine mm -hmm. was uh, spent most of my time aboard ships, where I was largely responsible for producing power, uh, producing water, and really that was kind of my initial introduction uh, to energy. Yeah, we basically had a floating island, if you will, at sea, and I was deployed during the war, and uh, you know, access to power and access uh, to water and other services. Um, it was a, a key component of my job. So that was really my first introduction to energy. Um, mm. From there, I decided to go to law school and I wanted to get back uh, into the energy business. Uh, so I started a law firm that really had a focus on uh, energy regulatory work and did a lot of cool things of uh, the law firm called Morgan Lewis, a lot of uh, permitting of new technologies, uh, a lot of permitting and high stakes regulatory work associated with the oil and gas industry. Um, actually did a lot of nuclear work uh, as mm. well, which uh, was in 08, 09, but the uh, nuclear industry was going through a bit of a renaissance and hopefully yep. uh, it will come back and got some great exposure. My family, um, uh, especially my dad was a lifelong entrepreneur. Uh, took a little while for the entrepreneurial uh, bug and itch to kind of get to me and, <laughs> and it did. And I saw some problems. Uh, which I'm looking forward to discussing today uh, when I was a lawyer and hope to solve them uh, when I started Arbo. Yeah, well, it's probably the combination. It's uh, yet another illustration of, of individuals with a intersecting disciplines. In your instance, a, tr a trio, uh, energy, but in, the, in a more military context, but to be very clear, big American um, uh, warships are floating cities. I mean, they are, they're gigantic and they have to be fully... Uh, self-contained. And then, of course, the energy focus and then the legal focus. So it's a classic, you have that sort of classic <laughs> entrepreneurial, you know, sitting at the intersection of some things that are changing and moving and providing perspective there. 
Yeah, and I, think, and I think, you know, oftentimes with entrepreneurship, it is that combination of various perspectives. It isn't necessarily just just one. And I was, no. I was happy to have, as you well put it, you know, that kind of trifecta happen at the right time. And then a very supportive uh, wife and family to help me get the business <laughs> off the ground. That's also probably a very, very important foundational component for any entrepreneur who's at least going to be successful. Now, the problems you picked up on, those surfaced mostly when you were on the regulatory uh, side, not ne- not on the warship side, I'm gathering. Yeah, that, that's definitely right. I, I spent a lot of time, as, as do a lot of lawyers still, uh, sifting through filings, you know, in search of information, uh, which they uh, invariably hope uh, would be digital. And yep. then you could bring some data and some analytics to it. And, you know, a lot of the initial focus and kind of founding story around Arbo was really to try and transform that energy regulatory data for which there's a trove of information that's out there, find a way to structure it and then turn it into intelligence that could really drive you know, some of the infrastructure permitting and commercial decisions that the industry um, is always going through, but they become even more tangled when we start talking about permitting um, you know, in today's day and age. Yeah. What's baffling, though, is that these regulations, if I think about the individual actually, you know, write the regulations, they're sitting at computers just like everybody else. Nobody does this on <laughs> anymore. So uh, what, what, was, what was the gap here? Like, why, why, why wouldn't, or, I mean, it's just a, being Canadian, I don't have as much exposure to the U.S. regulatory setting, but I, I can guess. Um, but, but just, you know, what was the, what's the gap here? Like, surely the, the information was it, already in a digital format. It's created digitally. Yeah, I, I think the gap is is actually quite simple. The gap is many people think of information as being data, but information is not necessarily data that they, then can be analyzed and turned into analytics, and then you know even further turned into different types of predictive models. And, and part of the problem was uh, the energy industry and, and most highly regulated industries, including the person that's uh, you know typing up the regulation, as you you know rightly put, uh, is putting in unstructured information uh, into a filing that's stored perhaps uh, somewhere electronically or not. Um, and then you need to develop the technology to really you know, parse that information to pull out what's relevant um, to hopefully answer the question you're trying to solve. And initially when we founded the company and it was around the 2014 timeframe, the big problem that the industry was trying to solve is, as at least the United States and most of the world was trying to you know, do that shift from coal to gas, yep. was how long is it gonna take to build uh, transportation necessary to move that product that was going to help decarbonize the world and bring power you know, to many more people. And yeah. you know, that was the issue we were solving for. So we really knew ahead of time, if we could dissect that permitting process, and we focused initially on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which has oversight of the building of natural gas pipelines, um, as well as LNG terminals. So we could dissect that process, build data, and ultimately turn it into analytics. Uh, that we could really be a transformative company as well as one that can you know, really help the industry. So this, uh, the technology, if I sort of dis- distill this down, my very simple brain works. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure this out. So I, I, I'm sitting here with piles of, of which, what you characterize as unstructured data documents, uh, text, and um, you know tables, diagrams, free text, copy, that sort of stuff. It's written by lawyers for lawyers, typically, maybe for engineers. Uh, and uh, so you're paying lawyers to read other lawyers' work and then try and make sense of it. Is this really solving for, um, is it time that you're solving for, the high cost of just trying to sift through the information? What, what is the, what's the economic piece of the puzzle here that, that was gr- got your attention? Yeah, it, it just said differently. I, I think of the, the value proposition here. Yeah. Um, and if you look at it on a scale, the way I've always thought about value propositions is you know, efficiency and time uh, is, is very important in saving you know, someone's time because time yep. is money is yep. key. But if you can help uh, a customer base with technology, you know, with data and services, um, if you can help them make money, then you really have a winning solution. And, and our hypothesis at the time, which has been proven out over the past eight years of running the business, was that if we could help infrastructure developers early on set better time frames and driven by analytics as to how long it would take to build energy infrastructure, 
Yep. That time ultimately would be money. And it's money in the sense that now that asset um, you know, will not have deferred revenue. You know, sometimes, you know, as we've seen recently, deferred revenue over years on end, uh, yep. would be, it would be in a better position to attract um, you know, new shippers, uh, new producers of the product. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's proven to be a solution that hadn't, sol- hadn't been solved at the time. And it's a problem that you know, needs to be solved in many other areas in order for the world to uh, move to uh, some of its net zero targets. Yeah. So way less about saving individuals time in, you know, the, the mechanical aspect of working with the data, but much more pull the ultimate project forward in time so that it can be constructed more reliably um, on a specific timeline, which in turn allows you to do things like finance it much more advantageously, uh, syndicate the financing if it, if need be, uh, attract different partners to work on it because you've got greater certainty. Is that is that a way to think about this? Yeah, exactly. And the only thing I'd add to that, um, a really good overview, Jeff, is that you know, when you're making those early commercial decisions, there's an origination team, there's a huge business development team oh, yeah. that's out there, and they're and they're trying to they're coming up with phenomenal ideas on what to build and why, what the country yep. needs, what the world needs, yep. et cetera, from an energy standpoint. In order to sell that deal and build their story, that's where not having data and analytics is a tough it's a tough place to be in. Oh yeah. Uh, said said differently, when you have the data and analytics to show, hey, I'm company A. I built these projects before. This is how long it's taken. This is how much it's cost. This is how we compare and benchmark to competitors. Um, you know, that's a winning solution, and that's what we help our customers do on a day-to-day basis. Which it was really done before, uh, you know, through a very small sample set of information. The, uh, I'm, I'm working um, or have some exposure to some of these kinds of projects uh, today is the and everything from hydrogen projects to liquefied natural gas exports to um, and probably this applies to sh- wind ups and shutdowns like which which plant do you target to wind up or move away from coal say to gas uh, you could apply this uh, this problem to all of these different investments. Uh, at uh, that are un- not on, un- not only underway in Canada in the United States, but but all around the world. Even the EU is now is putting forward uh, a uh, sh- structured um, a tax relief and uh, advantageous permitting for infrastructure to be built. Yeah, that, that that's exactly right, and it, it continues to grow. So if we were sitting here two years ago, or, or even really a year ago, there'd be very little discussion about the need for build out of, let's call it hydrogen pipelines or CO2 pipelines. There'd be very little discussion about the reality of carbon capture you know, and storage or sequestration. But those are all mainstream topics that I oh, yeah. think, at least at this point, fast forward now a year or two, um, you know, are not uh, uh, polarizing topics uh, to bring about. They're all needed uh, infrastructure. And guess what? They're all going to have permitting issues associated with them. And the permitting yeah. issues also sometimes evolve into there's various new environmental issues. There's opposition. Opposition tactics have gotten far more sophisticated and problematic. Yeah. And again, these are all data sets that feed into trying to answer the question related to how, how long is it going to take to build infrastructure and how do I get more certainty so I'm able to in fact build that infrastructure. You mentioned uh, just quickly there, sort of quick quick comment, but those who are opposed to uh, the uh, investments in, in new energy or energy infrastructure, can you elaborate a bit uh, what you mean by the, the, uh, the storyline involving those uh, who may, you know, may, may mount opposition to an investment? Sure. Yeah, we, we've seen it um, from fossil projects to electric transmission and renewable projects. Um, oftentimes, it's referred to as sort of you know the not in my backyard um, NIMBY. concept, yep. NIMBY concept. Yep. Uh, but what we've seen in, in the eight or nine years of running the business is really these groups have become far more sophisticated, very well funded, and some of the largest law firms uh, in the world where you know they train. Um, you know, experts in environmental law and energy law are moving, you know, to groups that are well funded to, in fact, oppose uh, energy infrastructure development. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, people think the opposition to electric transmission, you know, which is a huge component of the, you know, decarbonization uh, story that that it won't exist there or it won't exist with solar or wind. But that's 
that's flat wrong. It does. Wrong, right? You yeah. run into issues with you run into issues with uh, environmental or endangered species. You run into issues that are you know more local, and you know, it's a big it's a big issue that we're um, hopefully as a country and a world can can solve. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about uh, the kinds of results that that companies can experience if they uh, take advantage of uh, much more streamlined regulatory information access and analytics? What are they, like what's the, what's the what's the the results they're telling you they get? Yeah. So just to kind of rehash a few that I that I said before yeah. and, and add on top of them, yeah. um, you know, one you're able to quite simply win more deals um, and the speed to execution uh, on your uh, project. So we sometimes say from, you know, from concept to execution uh, yep. is going to be increased uh, dramatically, um, you know, determining the viability uh, of a project early on, you know, is it going to, is it going to be able to be built or not? Um, you know, sometimes these projects are many billions of dollars. There's a lot of money at risk, both if you're financing the project or you're someone who's committed to ship uh, your product. Um, and um, obviously, there's the time efficiency as well. What used to take you know many months and yeah. you know a lot of money of outside consultants yep. and internal angst with people with a lot of different spreadsheets. Uh, that aren't really systematically woven together, um, you know, in a system for the company um, mm-hmm. is now done so by, you know, using, you know, Arbo and our uh, services and offerings. Does this mean as well, you could, uh, if you're a, you could price a project more aggressively or differently because you have different insight? We do. You know, one of the areas that we've grown pretty significantly in the past several years is working with customers to better understand what the cost is of a project. So yep. some people, some project developers call this the, the total installed cost, but there's a lot of line items um, that feed into that. And the more analytics and data you have associated with what the, the project's going to cost, you know, the better you're going to be about being able to sell that project and ultimately be able to execute on the project. And we've yep. developed a database over the years, again, using similar technology to develop um, what was unstructured and data that wasn't really normalized into something that project developers could use. And as a result, guess what? Knowing the timing of the permitting process is directly related to how much a project's going to cost. So if you can yeah. answer both questions, um, you, you're really in a sweet spot for helping project developers. Yeah, I can see absolutely see that. One of the, uh, if you're an, in an M&A business, as an example, and you're, you want to think about rolling up an industry or making a pitch on some assets, um, your ability to, uh, with the analytics, give you that little bit of extra insight means you can sharpen your, your M&A uh, uh, targeting much more surgically than, say, someone who is uh, operating a bit more randomly, I would suspect. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, we, we work with um, you know, many on the finance side, uh, both equity, um, private equity, and then we do a lot of work with commodity traders who oh, are generally yeah. moving, moving fit. I mean, their job is to physically move product uh, yep. and optimize it in a way uh, that they can you know, make money because yep. they're for, for profit industries. And, you know, basically a lot of the questions that our project developers ask are commodity trading and marketing customers ask similar questions. And, you'll find similar value from the service. I, I did a project years ago for a uh, pipeline. Can't go into, you know, obviously the <laughs> very specifics, but the question they asked was, uh, how would our customers and competitors react if we were to do this particular project? Happened to be a storage project. And the question, the, the asset would have been some storage assets on a pipeline um, a system the uh, concept was they could pull product off the pipeline, put it into storage, and put it back into the pipeline when conditions were advantageous. And uh, the question was, how would the how would their competitors react? Uh, and so we we came up with the idea of using game theory to craft mm. a simulation of the different parties involved in the uh, this particular scenario, including customers and competitors. And the, what the game theory was telling us ultimately was that the, such an asset would disadvantage the customer and only yeah. advantage the competitors. And so obviously <laughs> the project didn't yeah. proceed. Is that kind of analytic, the sort of thing that you're also able to get into? Because for us, it was very painful to do because we had to do it all in Excel spreadsheets, very manual and very subjective. And it wasn't, a lot, it wasn't as data rich as I would have liked it to be. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you the, uh, an example by analogy back to environmental groups and opposition tactics, because that, yeah. that comes up quite frequently. You have a, a new project, an idea, commercial teams bought off in it, engineering services bought off in it. And then the next question is going to be, do we know who's going to be opposed to the project? Why? And then when will they get involved? And yep. we bring in you know data and analytics to say, uh, let's just take an environmental group, Sierra Club or the NRDC. We, right. We can yeah. we can say, OK, we know we know they've protested at this point in time in this proceeding. The outcome um, has generally led to projects taking, you know, uh, this much longer than they would have when NRDC or Sierra Club in this hypothetical uh, were yeah. not involved. So in very similar um, you know, process there, sometimes nowadays those answers lead to go no go criteria. Uh, yeah. which is amazing. It's probably similar to your analysis of, you know, what would the marketplace or our, our, our shippers, our customers think of this specific yeah, project? Yeah, exactly. What we did in that case was we uh, crafted, if you like, uh, proxy competitors and mm. proxy customers. So individuals who were trusted and inside, so there was no non-disclosure worries, but we said to say this executive, you're going to play the role of this competitor. Uh, this executive, we said, you're going to play the role of this customer. Let's try and understand your preference tree uh, to see how you would react to this and why. And that's where, you know, we got, got the, the game told us that the, the outcome was not great. And hence the project was shut down. Um, so didn't, it didn't actually <laughs> proceed. Yeah. But, but I can, it's amazing. It's amazing how much benchmarking, um, how critical that is uh, as sort of a general uh, use case for a lot of our products and services, yeah. just knowing what your competitors, because there's really, there's a lot and it gets really into the details. Just oh, yesterday, yeah. our team spent a significant amount of time with several different customers dissecting competitors, tariffs and what cha- what type of services and charges and structures and kind of the mon- sometimes mundane world yep. of tariffs, which is basically like, what am I, uh, what are the rules associated with how I charge my customer? But there's real money to be made there if you can dissect that regulatory information and turn it into a commercial decision making tool. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, tell me what uh, some of the ob- obstacles and objections you hear when you, you know, rock up to some uh, some some uh, or- organization you have no familiarity with or not are new to, and you go, "Hey, guess what? We 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 can bring this <laughs> regulatory insight to bear." And oh, well, by the way, it might tell you not to do your project. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> that's an outcome. Uh, what's what's their reaction to this? Do they are they skeptical or do they are they becoming more open to it now that we're seeing the the role of generative AI products? like chat GPT and how you know you can interpret vast quantities of text quite easily yeah they, they've definitely become more in, more interested in, in the um, the asymmetry between what they knew about analytics and advanced technology based products um, has been reduced dramatically yep. um, some of some of the objections if you will early on is typically inertia um, you know our products and services generally span, Several the value at least spans several different groups within an organization, yep. and if you've worked with big companies, and we you know have roughly fifty or so very large companies, um, you know that makes uh, that makes for some difficulty in the sales process because you need to get several different groups on board. So Line sometimes down. there's some uh, sometimes there's some inertia uh, there. Um, yep. there. Sometimes there's a little bit of a job security. There's five or six people with various spreadsheets or databases. They've at times maintained over yep. several years and they yep. want to, they know they bring value to the business uh, that way. And then I'd say kind of, you know, lastly, Jeff, the, sometimes there's, we are not a direct fit and replace for an existing product or service. So typically, you know, there needs to be a discussion about where this fits within, you know, budgetary, um, you know, outlines and alignments. Yeah, that gets more complicated because you know start dealing with organizational constructs, lines of responsibility, right. who reports to who, and and to sort of shoehorn something in that the, even though it adds tremendous value, it's it's can be quite disruptive, which will slow down uh, slow down things like adoption. Yeah, that, that's definitely right, and uh, something I've. Um, had the joy and sometimes the pain of struggling with over the course of the past uh, past couple of years. Yeah, no kidding. 
Now, there must be uh, some uh, some untapped potential out there, like when you can think about, you know, just the, the Inf- Inflation Reduction Act, and uh, if you can kind of peeled back the half a trillion dollars tucked into that in, in incentives. It seems to me there's a, there's, a, there's a dramatic opportunity here. It's very large, has to be large. Is that is that correct, or is is there is this area this business uh, uh, model now getting to a level of maturity? Yeah, there's there's huge opportunity. I think what most, I mean, if we're sitting here, like I said before, two years two years ago, energy wasn't really an in vogue topic. It no. was you know it was all things climate. Uh, it was you know, forget about fossils; they'll, they'll all die, um, and let's move on you know to renewable energy development. And you know, given circumstances, you know, overseas in Europe and abroad, um, I think the tune has really changed to a much more balanced discussion. Which I think, regardless of your viewpoint, I think a generally a balanced, thoughtful discussion is a good one. Um, yeah. I, in my role, I generally think about on a daily basis what are our core capabilities as a team. Like, where do we deliver value for our customers? Why do they value that? And how can that be aligned? With an area for growth in the industry and the, the biggest value i see when i think about the question that way really is in the development of the electric transmission space because yeah. i tend to think and i've said it many times before that there's really n- no transition without transmission like we saw that on the gas side and the big build out of um you know thousands of miles of pipelines years yep. ago and you know we, we need we must have that in order to be successful with many of our goals um, on the electric side. Yeah. And transmission is a major problem uh, because uh, the way we do it, big towers, um, high voltage cables, there's lots and lots of property to cross and uh, regulatory um, uh, uh, structures through, I don't know what level they go in the United States, but I know in Canada, it's absolutely the provincial level. You have to be dealing at very, very micro, micro levels. Uh, I assume it's the same scenario in the United States. Yeah, it's, it's it's very similar. It's it's kind of um, in a way, it's a patchwork of yeah. processes and regulations. But really, it boils down to, you know, in the United States, we have this interesting um, sort of micro grid, if you will, what's referred to as the, um, the RTOs and ISOs, oh, yeah, um, yeah. which are really regulated through FERC, but they have their own process uh, and a queue, if you will, although it's really not as efficient um, as queuing up at the deli to get a sandwich. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of similar questions that are asked, like how long does it take? What are some of the predictive indicators as to whether the project's real or not? Um, but then, you know, from that, you also have state and local uh, permitting issues. But unlike the gas space, at least in the United States, uh, on the power side, when it comes to transmission, there is no one federal regulator. Yeah. And that creates a lot of uncertainty, but raises the question, do we want one federal regulator or not? So uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see how it shapes up. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. I think the uh, the, the model, the uh, North American model is, uh, because the U.S. is such a big and, and, ex- and interesting market, It's uh, it may have some spillover uh, effects and consequences uh, globally. I do know that, you know, if, if for example, when Canada and the United States want to do a cross-border connect, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a particularly challenging endeavor. And um, not just one regulator, not just a provincial regulator and a state regulator, Later, but you now have a uh, national regulators and that have to deal with the cross-border issues. E- yet another layer of uh, complexity here. Yeah, th- this is not a uniquely American problem. No, I mean we are not. We, I mean, when you compare though the the distance, the the amount of high voltage uh, HVDC lines that have been built out over the course of the past decade, it's incredibly small when compared to other countries of similar size, like if you mm-hmm. compare it to China. And mm-hmm. I think most research shows that we need to build that grid out at a rate of four to five times uh, what we've built before. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a big that's a, that's a big undertaking and you know something we need um, you know, to really get the, the policymakers that are a couple blocks away from our office. Um, they really need to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> because it's and a big fat. problem. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So, so you've now at your um, uh, in your entrepreneurial phase, having gone from uh, you know first in the uh, uh, service of the country, uh, then to law, and now in as an entrepreneur, uh, I'm sure you, you 
people ask you for, you know, <laughs> chipisms, if you like, your life lessons, <laughs> things you tell people, hey, you got to think about this, or here's, here's what I believe in. One, one, one you mentioned already was there, there ain't no transition without the transmission. So that's a great one. What other, what other um, chipisms are there, or other bits of advice you share with people? Yeah, I try and I try and keep it keep it pretty simple. Uh, one <laughs> that I use and have on a little post-it note every day and and, and plan you know my days and, and weeks is people, product, and profit. And I always put it in that order. I think when you're you know growing your business, if you if you focus on your people first, then the product and the profit will will follow. And that's worked um, incredibly well for us. It's also uh, for me the most fun. Uh, I got into the entrepreneurial world, um, because I love people, wanted to grow a team and want to be surrounded by incredibly bright people that brought capabilities to the business and also to the industry that I didn't have. And, uh, that's been a lot of fun you know, to develop. And, you know, with that, you develop great products and you end up uh, serving your clients well. And if you're doing that, you're probably going to build a great uh, business. Um, I'd probably say the second thing, um, is that everything seems about 10 times harder as an entrepreneur than you ever initially think it's going to be. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're founding a business, uh, getting involved with a business, um, you really have to love it. You have to be um, almost obsessed um, you know, with um, the services, the solutions, the people um, around you and, and the impact that you're having. Because if you don't, um, that 10 times uh, level of effort is going to feel that much that much harder for you. Yeah. Yeah. Dramatically harder. I, I'm personally, to a degree, I'm a, a somewhat of an entrepreneur because when I left my own uh, world with, uh, as, as a professional consultant and started on my own, yeah, it's, you, you appreciate just how much work it is to stand up a business. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. I have a lot of time for entrepreneurs who are uh, trying to invent the world. Yeah, that's that's spot on. But, you know, it's uh, and one thing you also realize is you can't do everything yourself. And I think I very early on realized what I was good at and the things I wasn't as good at. And I've been uh, fortunate enough that people uh, that work with us that are way better at the things I wasn't good at. And that's you know a real force multiplier. Yeah, absolutely right. Chip, this has been a fascinating discussion on uh, this. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Jeff. Really enjoyed it. That was Chip Moldenhauer, who is the founder and CEO of Arbo. From naval vessels to law practice to entrepreneur, Chip shows how expertise developed in multiple disciplines over time can lead to entrepreneurial success. I really liked his story about how Time at Sea provided him with insight into the energy sector. Thanks for listening to the Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. This podcast can be found everywhere podcasts are available, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find all the resources and links mentioned in the episode in the show notes, and you can listen to the previous episodes at jeffreycan.com. If you have a moment, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes as it helps others find the show, along with other great content. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. The podcast returns in a week with another episode, so stay tuned.